Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. <clears throat> In the States we call it hump day, so whatever you want to call it, it's the middle of the week. What? And if you're well new to my channel, welcome, welcome, welcome. Because it's Wednesday and there's a W, well I'm on the website. And I'm also on YouTube. See how I'm using this alliteration with the W's and website and Twitter and Tumblr and on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Facebook Friday. It makes it really easy to remember, kind of, except for Twitter, Tumblr, you could get a little confused, but whatever. Um, oh, and this beige monstrosity is Sean's new filing cabinet. We're trying to get him organized. And I told him it's ruining my shot. Ah, so this weekend we're going to get it moved. Um, but because I'm on two sites, this today's video is always a little bit longer, so I'll try to get cooking on it. Um, there are four questions. I take two from each site, and I also have a journal topic. So thanks, Rachel, for that journal topic. Without further ado, let's get cracking. Sorry, I just <clears throat> drank a lot of water. Okay, question number one. What is your opinion on documentaries, movies, and TV shows on eating disorders and self-harm? Do you think it might glamorize it and give people ideas, or do you think it spreads awareness? Also, do non-disordered people watch things like that? Thanks. I thought this was a good question because there's a lot of these popping up, whether it's even on TV and documentaries and stuff, but also books and articles. And honestly, I think it's wonderful that mental illness as a whole is getting more limelight, more eyeballs on it. It's gonna, it's spreading awareness. And as long as it's done properly, meaning that it's not glamorized, that the illnesses that they're portraying in the film or in the article or whatever is done properly and it's, you know, shown all different types. It's not just one person and one experience because I think that that's really pigeonholing and it can make people feel really left out or alone and can make you feel worse about um, something you're already struggling with. Um, so as long as it's done properly, I support it. I think it definitely spreads awareness. The more we talk about it, the more people, um, you know, create new media about it. Obviously video, I'm on video right now, can be very powerful and it can do a lot more than we can in words sometimes. And so the more we do it, I think the better. Um, will it give people ideas? I don't think so. I always tell my clients, I'm like, you can't catch a mental illness. If you're gonna struggle with something, you're gonna use something to cope, you're gonna do it. Um, there are even articles from way, way, way back in the olden days when they didn't use the term eating disorder because they didn't know what it was, but people would pass away from not eating, purposefully not eating. I forget the term that they used to call it, but it'll probably come back to me right after I finish this video. But anyway, you can't catch a mental illness, so I wouldn't worry about that. But as long as they do the, um, the disorders justice, I think it's great. And non-disordered people do watch it. That's the wonderful thing um, about it. When one of my friends was struggling with the eating disorder in high school, I used to watch anything on eating disorders that I could get my hands on because it helped me better understand her experience. So yeah, we definitely do. Okay, question number two. Hey Katie, how much or how do I know which level of eating disorder treatment I should aim for? I'm currently seeing a counselor and I'll be able to see my GP or general practitioner like your regular doctor soon. How do I know if this is enough or if I should seek further treatment? Thanks. It's a great question and something that a lot of us, you know, don't think about until we're in that time and in that moment we're like, well, crap, what do we need? How much? I don't know. <clears throat> what I always tell my clients is if you're in a certain level of care, so let's go from the lowest. You're just seeing your therapist once a week and you see your, your general practitioner, doctor, or whatever, once a month or whatever for check-ins or however you're doing it. Um, if you find yourself yourself still backsliding at that point, you're like, oh, I just can't get a hold of it, and you're finding the urges to be too much, and you're finding yourself feeling worse, then take it to the next step. So let's do a IOP program where it's outpatient, but you go in for you know majority of the day, and you have groups, and you have therapy twice a week, and we start increasing the amount of time we're in therapy. And if you find yourself still black backsliding, we go up to the next level where we're an inpatient and we're, we live in a facility <clears throat> where we're getting care. And the reason that I say this is for two, re is two reasons. Number one is because there's no need for us to put you in more care that costs more money and makes can potentially take time out of your life that maybe you don't need. There's no reason for us to do that until you need it, until the need is there. Also, secondary in the States, we have uh, private insurance a lot of times and it's so, so, so much easier to get things covered if we've already tried the treatment step below and it didn't work, it wasn't enough. Um, because that's what they always recommend. Like, well, if you tried this, if someone goes from like nothing into inpatient and we're like, that's clearly, you know, that, so it makes it easier when we're talking to them to get things approved. And it's like, bam, we don't even have to worry about it. So 
yeah, that's how I'd um, figure it out. And if any of you have anything that resonated with you or someone said or did or a way that you figured out the level of treatment you need, let us know below. As always, I love your comments. Experiences can, you know, really help people and remind them that they're not alone. Okay. Question number three. Hey, Katie, what are your thoughts on the rubber band theory for people who self-harm? I was just given an elastic from my therapist to use to try to replace cutting, but I've also heard it doesn't count because you're still self-harming yourself. Any thoughts? Thank you. I've received a lot of questions about rubber band uh, use in recovery from cutting or self-harming in any way. Um, and I don't know if it's because therapists are giving out elastics every day now, but it's definitely something that can help. People squeeze ice cubes, people snap rubber bands, people use markers, or there are a ton of different things. Um, Calorique on Tumblr has a bunch of different ways to, and things to do um, before you use your eating disorder or self-harm. So if you're looking for distraction tools, she has a whole list and it's amazing. So um, you can check that out. Um, but as far as what I think, I think it's perfectly fine. It definitely counts. If you're not self-harming, you're not self-harming. If you're snapping a rubber band, when you feel really upset or urges get really bad, it can help distract you. It can also help remind you to, to switch, to do something, to journal, to talk, call a friend, to, it can be a nice reminder. I used to have this friend in, um, back in high school. Uh, wow, I'm really digging deep into the files, the dark files, the old files. But um, I remember I played soccer with her and I won't say her name because I don't want her to potentially watch us someday and get embarrassed. Um, but she was struggled with our coach because he was a total dick face and I hated him. Um, but she had anger issues and her mom sent her to therapy, you know, being a good mother. And she had to snap this rubber band every time she had like a negative thought. And it was a reminder for her to think of a positive thought. And it was really great. It's something that can really help. Um, we do, however, need to watch how much we're doing it. If we're doing it all the time, every day, all day, we might need to come up with some other coping skills along with the rubber band. Also, if we're welting, if we're it's cutting into us, if we're bleeding in any way, nix it. Then I would say no, because I don't want you using it as a self-harm tool. I want it to be a distraction slash snap out of it, pun intended, um, and think of something else, change what's going on, talk back to it, call a friend, get out of the house, you know, any number of things that can help distract you, okay? Question number four. Hey Katie, I've been in years of counseling and even been in a psych ward and a residential home for girls for six months and I can tell my story over and over again about the abuse and all the fun stuff, but I just can't seem to let myself cry during sessions. I think parts of it is fear of letting go. I hate to lose control, which is why I still struggle with self-harm been struggling for 11 years and an eating disorder for nine years. Could it possibly be that the fear of being getting betrayed by my counselor again? I have been in, um, sorry, I have been to about six different counselors and the first two betrayed my trust with them. Is it, is that causing a stumbling block with my current one? Could trust play a factor? I want to cry. I really do. I just can't get myself to do it. It's like everything numbs up in session. And this is very common and it had a lot of conversation, a lot of replies on the website. So I knew this was something that I'm sure a lot of people struggle with. How do we allow ourselves to cry? How? Because crying is such a vulnerable thing. If someone's crying, they have no defenses left. We're, I mean, although I have been known to angry cry sometimes, I get so angry that I cry. So that would be a lie. My defenses are definitely up. But if we're crying about a situation that has been really traumatic to us and really hurtful to us, then crying is, is very vulnerable and it can feel very out of control. And a lot of us have trouble letting go of the control and allowing ourselves to feel feelings and embrace them and recognize them as they come up. And that's part of DBT is like recognizing our emotions, welcoming them, accepting them and moving on. Um, so how do we let ourselves start to cry? There's a bunch of different things, okay? Number one could be trying it on your own. If it's a trust factor, if it's something about being around people you don't know, talking to a counselor that maybe could betray your trust, if it's that, then I think it could really, really help for you to try it on your own. Try journaling, try listening to sad music, watch a sad movie and allow yourself to cry, to sob, to ugly cry, to whatever, snot and blah, and it doesn't matter. Let yourself do it and feel it. 
Um, that's usually the first thing I, I recommend with patients because it's easier when you're on your own sometimes. But if, if that doesn't help either and you want to do it in group, I would begin to talk about that fact that it's hard to cry, that you feel it come up. I would even notice where you go in your body when you don't. Do you swallow hard? Do you blink a lot? Do you clench your teeth? Do you feel, where do you feel it? Where are you stuffing that emotion? Because usually when we feel like we're gonna cry, we put it somewhere. I put it in my shoulders usually, and I swallow hard, like if it's not appropriate, because I'm a crier. I'll admit it, I'm a full-fledged crier. Um, and, but sometimes it's not appropriate. I'm like, I don't wanna do this here. Oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. I like, I swallow and I, whew, and I, I, I usually you know, do something with my shoulders. So just pay attention and start slow. Start noticing. It's not something that can happen because it's something that we've learned as a coping skill. Oftentimes we were you know, teased as kids for crying or parents made us feel really badly about crying. And we have this negative connotation about crying. And so we're gonna have to change that slowly. Find people you trust, find situations that are really safe for you where no one can come in on you. You can cry and be loud and whatever, no one will know. Um, and also just start journaling about what it is. What does crying mean to you? If you cry, does it mean you're weak? Does it mean you're, you know, you can't take it? Does it mean that you're just stupid? Is it embarrassing? What does it mean? And then we'll change the dialogue that we have with ourselves about emotion because crying can be so cathartic and I would encourage you to, to slowly transition into allowing yourself to, okay? If any of you have good tips on that, as always, leave them below. Okay, here's a journal topic. Thanks, Rachel. Rachel sent this over to me, so thank you so much. And I love this, and it's something that she had happen in her counseling session. Well, I'll just read it before I blab on too much, but she thought we could use it too. Hey, Katie, so this isn't really a quote, but I think it's definitely something to think about slash thought-provoking. Today in therapy, I was complaining about my eating disorder and things just being really difficult in recovery. And I said how I hoped that what I have been through is the hardest thing that I'll ever face in my life, to which my therapist responded, Believe it until life proves you wrong. I just thought that this was amazing and could maybe help others in their outlooks in any given situation. Like, believe it. This is the hardest thing until life proves you wrong. But for right now, we're going to believe wholeheartedly that it is. And that can really help us move past those like real shitty times when we think, you know, nothing's going our way and nothing's getting better. Um, believe that you're through it and you're done with it. And it is the hardest thing. I think that's a really cool quote. So thanks, Rachel. Have a wonderful evening. I will see you all tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday, so I'll be on Twitter. So ask your questions there using the hashtag KDFAQ. Okay, bye.